Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we are back talking about the endocrine system. This is our second lecture series talking about steroids, NSAIDs, and acetaminophen, and this is uh, video part two. Now we're going to talk about uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, commonly known as NSAIDs. These drugs all work on the cyclooxygenase enzymes, also known as COX enzymes. These are enzymes involved in the conversion of a substance called arachidonic acid down to prostaglandins. And prostaglandins, uh, as we will see in a moment, do a number of different functions in the body. There are two different kinds of COX enzymes. There are COX-1 enzymes, and these are called constitutive enzymes, which means they always have a constant level of activity. The three main things you need to know about the COX-1 enzyme is that it maintains and protects your gastric mucosa so you don't get bleeding um, and erosion of the mucosa. It helps generate platelet aggregation. It makes your platelets clump together appropriately. And it is involved in maintenance of good renal blood flow. Those are three body functions that are um, facilitated by the COX-1 enzyme and this is constant in your body. The COX-2 enzyme is called inducible, which means that it only uh, gets to work at specific times, and those times are when there's an injury, and really it only occurs at the sites of injury. So pain and inflammation, which are mediated by a prostaglandin called PGE2, those things occur when COX-2 starts working. COX-2 makes your peripheral nociceptors, your pain receptors, work more sensitively. COX-2 can cross the blood-brain barrier to also make you feel more pain via spinal cord receptors. And the COX-2 enzyme is responsible for fever. So just by looking at this, you can see if we wanted to design a drug for anti-inflammatory, we would want it to work primarily on the COX-2 side of things. Here's a diagram that shows the same thing again. Arachidonic acid going to make different kinds of prostaglandins, some of which protect your GI tract, are involved in hemostasis, that is platelet aggregation, and in normal renal function by normal blood flow. And that's all done by the COX-1 enzyme. And then other prostaglandins which are responsible, responsible for pain, fever, and inflammation as facilitated by the COX-2 enzyme. So NSAIDs typically block both of the enzymes. They're nonspecific, and we get the good effects of avoiding these pain, fever, and inflammation but we also lose gastric protection, hemostasis, and renal function. As we'll see later, there are COX-2 specific inhibitors which act only on the COX-2 enzyme. So let's go into this in some detail now. Why are we interested in NSAIDs? Because they have a lot of desirable features. They uh, can deactivate nociceptors and reduce pain. They can decrease inflammation. People don't get addicted or dependent to NSAIDs. They may actually have some synergy with opioids. They may even have some preemptive analgesia where you can give them before the pain begins and reduce the total amount of pain that occurs. There's no respiratory depression. There's really no nausea or vomiting. They have a nice long duration of action. They don't make you sleepy or confused. So there's a very favorable profile of effects and side effects with these drugs. The original NSAID was actually aspirin or acetyl salicylic acid. Aspirin is usually abbreviated ASA. Aspirin is good for pain. It's an antipyretic, which means it drops fever, and it is a good antiplatelet drug as well. The antiplatelet function is because it irreversibly acetylates um, COX-1. And we take advantage of this all the time. We give aspirin in the prevention and treatment of myocardial infarction and stroke and we put patients on aspirin after they get a coronary stent to prevent them getting a clot inside of their stent. Usually if someone's going to have a very invasive procedure we stop aspirin for seven to ten days um, which is a long enough time for those platelets to uh, expire and to new platelets to be generated that aren't blocked by aspirin. Aspirin doesn't have too much renal effect and the most common side effects are bleeding and GI upset. Some of the side effects of aspirin include bronchoconstriction or asthma. The book says that between 8 and 20 percent of all asthmatic adults will experience bronchoconstriction uh, when they're given aspirin, although I'm not sure how much we see that in patients 
who are taking aspirin nowadays, but that is what the books say. Now, aspirin is not used in children anymore, even though there is something out there called baby aspirin. Uh, but children haven't been given aspirin in several decades now, um, especially if they're having a viral syndrome, and that's because of something called Rye syndrome, which is an acute encephalopathy and hepatic failure that can occur uh, when children who have a viral syndrome are given aspirin. Uh, aspirin goes to the liver where it's hydrolyzed into salicylic acid and then it's metabolized and renally excreted. And patients who overdose on aspirin have an unusual combination of effects where they have CNS stimulation leading them to hyperventilate and even have seizures. So they become, uh, they, they have a, a respiratory alkalosis but from the aspirin itself, a metabolic acidosis. Ibuprofen, which goes by the brand names of Motrin or Advil, is a good analgesic, antipyretic, and anti-inflammatory drug. It's metabolized in the liver, and side effects most commonly include GI irritation and bleeding, and some platelet dysfunction. Patients who have pre-existing renal dysfunction may see a worsening of renal function, again because renal blood flow is decreased. There's also a drug called napri uh, naproxen, whose brand names are naproxen or Aleve, and they're really almost the same as ibuprofen, just with a twice daily dosing. Ketorolac, which is called Toradol, is a formulation available in IV or intramuscular formulation. It can be used as the sole drug for perioperative pain control or can be used together with opioids. They say that 30 milligrams of intramuscular toradol is as effective as 10 milligrams of uh, IV morphine. Toradol also causes inhibition of platelet aggregation, so we can see some bleeding effects. And it does decrease renal blood flow in certain patients, patients who have heart failure or hypovolemia, and so we need to be careful with those patients. The peak effect of Toradol occurs in 45 to 60 minutes, and its elimination halftime is about five hours, perhaps longer in the elderly. It's about 99% protein bound. NSAIDs are not recommended in pregnancy, especially during the third trimester not only because of potential increased bleeding, but also because the fetal ductus arteriosus, which is the um, part of the system that bypasses the fetal lungs, uh, that can close early. It can also limit renal blood flow in the fetus. There are some studies that link NSAIDs to premature birth and miscarriage. In kids, NSAIDs are typically used after age six months, and we do use them in the operating room as part of our perioperative pain control. Now we're going to talk about NSAIDs that don't block both of the COX enzymes, but only the COX-2 specific inhibitors. The one you're most likely to encounter is Celecoxib, also called Celebrex. And this is a drug used commonly for pain and inflammation in arthritis and orthopedic surgery. This drug is very well absorbed from the GI tract. There isn't much first pass metabolism, and it's felt to be much safer for patients who have gastritis or gastric ulcers uh, again, because the COX-1 system is not uh, affected nearly as much by these drugs. We don't see very many antiplatelet effects, and patients who have asthma tolerate them well. They are metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system in the liver and go on to renal excretion. Other COX inhibitors, COX-2 inhibitors, like Vioxx and Bextra, have been taken off the market. And this was actually because these patients had an increased risk of uh, myocardial infarction and stroke. And it seems that COX-2 specific inhibition can cause prothrombotic events. So while nonspecific COX inhibition seems to cause some bleeding, pure COX-2 inhibition seems to actually cause some clotting. And this graph over here shows some of the different NSAIDs that are available out there. Uh, you may not be familiar with all of the names, but on one end of the spectrum we have Ketorolac, or Toradol, moving through naproxen, ibuprofen, diclofenac, and then to the COX-2 specific inhibitors like Celebrex and Rofecoxib, which is now off the market. And as these become more and more COX-2 selective, we actually go from bleeding risk to actually a little bit of clotting risk. 
Uh, the other thing we see here is that even the most, uh, what we call a COX-2 inhibitor like Celebrex, still has some COX-1 inhibition as well. And here we see again in this graph proportional inhibition of COX-1 when COX-2 is inhibited by 80%. And you can see Celebrex still has about 40% COX-1 inhibition when 80% uh, COX-2 inhibition. <coughs> The last drug we're going to speak about today is Tylenol, acetaminophen. It's a good analgesic. It's a great antipyretic. It's not actually an NSAID because it's not anti-inflammatory and it's not part of the family of NSAIDs. Uh, the mechanism of Tylenol is not fully understood. There is probably some element of COX-2 inhibition or even COX-3, which we are not going to discuss today. But the main effect is probably mediated in the central nervous system. So Tylenol crosses the blood-brain barrier and acts somewhere in the nervous system and mediates pain and fever that way. Tylenol, as we've discussed before, has excellent synergy with opioids, and that's why we see all sorts of opioid acetaminophen combination medications. And acetamin, acetaminophen has really no effects on gastric irritation or on platelet function um, at all. Now acetaminophen is metabolized primarily in the liver into inactive metabolites. As we'll see shortly, there are toxins that are created and they are usually scavenged by glutathione. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Now because there's so much hepatic metabolism, we see a significant first pass effect when Tylenol is administered orally. And we'll come back to that point again when we talk about IV Tylenol. The main thing we want to be aware of at this moment is that when acetaminophen is given in higher doses, some toxins are created. For example, paraaminophenol, which is nephrotoxic, and N-acetyl-P-benzoquinone, which is hepatotoxic. Unfortunately, there are many, many instances of patients developing hepatic necrosis due to acetaminophen overdose, and that's usually defined as anything above 4 grams per day of Tylenol. This may occur in the setting of uh, suicide or error or patients who don't understand the dosing regimen for acetaminophen. The risk of hepatic necrosis is especially great in patients who are chronic alcohol users. This is because when you use alcohol chronically, your P450 activity increases and your glutathione stores decrease due to um, the chronic alcohol use. And patient, patients and students as well often ask if it's ever safe to take Tylenol and alcohol together. The data is not very um, definitive on this, but it seems that if someone has a lot of alcohol consumption and takes a single dose of acetaminophen the next day for a hangover, that's probably fine. And if a person is a heavy chronic alcohol user, let's say more than three drinks a day every day, a single dose of acetaminophen for a headache is also probably okay. Where we see problems are when patients are heavy chronic alcohol users and start taking several doses of acetaminophen a day. And that's when patients are at risk for hepatic necrosis. These patients may want to consider a lower daily maximum dose of Tylenol. Let's say maybe two grams a day and taking lower doses each time they take Tylenol. Just as an aside, this isn't in your notes. When patients do overdose on Tylenol, the drug that's used to treat that is called acetylcysteine. It's an antioxidant, um, and it can help prevent hepatic damage if it's given within eight hours of overdose. And there are these um, charts that are available where you can measure a patient's serum acetaminophen level and try to estimate how many hours it's been since they ingested the Tylenol. So if someone comes in eight hours after ingestion of Tylenol, and their serum acetaminophen level is 50, then they're probably going to be fine. But if it's uh, 100, then we can extrapolate what their original serum acetaminophen Tylenol level is and maybe consider treating them for toxicity. Tylenol is available in regular and extra strength tablets, and dosing is usually between 650 and 1,000 milligrams every six hours. We shouldn't exceed 4 grams in 24 hours. Most of the labels um, in the drugstore now say a uh, limit of 3 grams in 24 hours. And remember that uh, 
acetaminophen is available not just in Tylenol but in Percocet and Vicodin and Tylenol number three and all of those need to be taken into consideration when calculating the maximum daily dose of Tylenol. We also have Ofermev, which is IV acetaminophen, and the dosing is exactly the same as oral dosing. Some people think that um, one that IV or oral preparations of acetaminophen have different implications for the liver, but let me be clear that all of these drugs will ultimately be metabolized in the liver regardless of the route of administration. The difference is only in the first pass effect. When you give somebody a thousand milligrams of Tylenol by mouth, a lot of that drug will never make it into the systemic circulation because of the first pass effect. And so their CNS levels will be lower. But in the end, 100% of that Tylenol will be metabolized in the liver. However, 1,000 milligrams of IV Tylenol will distribute throughout the system without a first pass effect, and the initial CNS levels will be higher. All of that 1,000 milligrams will still end up in the liver at the end of the life of the drug, but the patient will get more pain relief or fever relief due to the IV dose. And many people use a Q6 hour scheduled dosing of either oral or IV acetaminophen to maintain a good plasma concentration. And this has been shown to be very helpful in reducing pain and even getting people discharged from the hospital sooner. That's all we have to say for today about NSAIDs and acetaminophen. If you have any questions, please let me know and we'll see you in class.